Yeah, thank you very much. So for those of you wondering, is this an angler talk? Actually, no, no, angler died, angler's gone, just went away, kind of fizzled. Some people are happy, I'm kind of sad. I had a love-hate relationship with angler, so I'm like, whatever. So we're gonna be talking about neutrino. I had about five weeks to prepare this. I researched angler on and off for about two years, and then, oh, Pastor Gerard, there you go. And then I found out, I was like, oh, I need to completely revamp my entire presentation. So, here we go, let's do it. <laughs> okay, our agenda for today, we're gonna be talking about neutrino, <laughs> not angular. We're gonna talk about what exploit kits are, how they function, how they work, and then we're gonna pull apart a sample. My focus today is on the exploit kit portion itself. So we're not gonna focus too much on the actual exploits that are being leveraged in there. I'll mention one of them in the we will break down what occurs, the shell code that actually runs, things of that nature, but I want to focus both, mostly on that. So for example, like the malware that it drops also, like we're just going to kind of reference that and move on. You'll see what I mean. All right, I like this to be kind of a two-way communication. So the B-Sites crew really likes it when people are involved and people participate, things of that nature. And I like to run my dad and often talk to people too, so it kind of works out, all right? So when I'm like, hey, who does this? You know, participate, or pretend like you're participating, one of them do it, whatever. And then here's my, yeah, well, we're not talking about Angular. <laughs> Sorry. The programs went to press before I actually officially changed it, so. No biggie. All right, this is me. I work at Incident Response for Bechtel Corporation. We're the largest construction and engineering and project management company in the United States, one of the biggest in the world. Think like mega projects, like tens of billions of dollars over <coughs> years and years and years. We build stuff. I don't build a damn thing. I don't swing a hammer, but you get the idea. I have some education stuff, some certs, but I know you don't give a damn, so moving on. I like to run my mouth though, and that's gonna help, because I like to present, and so, ah, I get to do that, let's do it. I like these things, I do uh, open mic comedy at the, uh, I was practicing earlier, by the way, <laughs> at a uh, local place where I live in Phoenix. I love retro gaming, I like to read sci-fi, fantasy stuff, and uh, anyone here do CrossFit? Raise your hand, don't lie, don't you lie. You know, the, you've heard the joke, right? How you know if someone does CrossFit or if they're a doctor? <laughs> yeah, they'll tell you. I started doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I'm turning into one of those guys. <laughs> They're like, oh, you have to do it, trying to convert all my friends. It's kind of sad. <laughs> this is our security operations center. It looks pretty. This is a professional photo we had taken, and I just like to show it off. Rupert hangs out and just poses for us. <laughs> all right, exploit kits, what are they? So, exploit kits, it, this is, it's a business. It's a business of exploiting hosts and getting a particular strain of malware onto the greater number of hosts as possible. This is business. This is a huge competition, the vendor-based competition. So you may have heard of Angular previously, and we're gonna talk about what happened to Angular, and we'll talk about Neutrino. But in reality, there's three primary actors. Let's just pretend, all right? Let's just play pretendies that some of you in here create your own malware. I'm sure you don't do that, right? So let's just say you did. And let's just say that you wanted to spread your malware to the most number of hosts possible. Like, how would you go about doing that? Well, you would basically hire someone who runs the exploit kit. And the thing is, you give them the malware, and their goal is to spread it for you. So there's three primary actors. There's the campaigns, the people who redirect the actual traffic to the exploit kit. There's the exploit kit people who run the infrastructure to try to exploit as many boxes as possible. And then there's the malware authors who provide their malware and then pay for it to be distributed. So it does so by, we're going to break down exactly how Katrina does it little thing here, but the idea is very simple. The exploit kit landing page enumerates the host, it checks its capabilities, it looks for non patch software essentially, and if it sees that something is vulnerable, it just goes, all right, go. And if it fails, it says, ah, fuck it. But if it works, then it goes, yay, and that's pretty much how it works. So it just casts a very wide net, if you will. The redirect process is pretty simple. The host over here, uh, the user over here, better yet, goes to what he or she believes is a completely legitimate site. <laughs> There's some funny ones to get exploited, by the way, but I'll uh, save that research for another talk. And when they go to this site, what happens is in the back end, their browser gets redirected over to a quote unquote bulletproof site, and that site is what's hosting the landing page for the exploit kit. This is typically done in the background and hidden iframes and all kinds of other fun stuff. The user has no idea it's even occurring, and exploitation occurs, and then, oops. So, anyone here familiar with a bulletproof site? You know what that term refers to? Yeah. You know what the can't say. All right, someone tell me. Copies. What? Copies. copies. They have good copies though, right? Damn, tea oils? Yeah, buddy, I like those. Man. How about a real answer? Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about not responding to abuse for Damn right, damn right. You know when there's a 
problem, like uh, EDUs always get popped, right? And they have open mail relays all the time, and they're being abused. So you send an email to the abuse department, and they have terms of service, and they immediately respond to that, right? Well, a like, bulletproof poster doesn't give a damn. They just click delete. <laughs> they say, I don't give a damn. So they use those to host their illegitimate software and such. Okay, before we get too far into this, I want to talk about mitigation, and this is part of the conversation piece here. We have a couple different tools at Bechtel that help us immensely with exploit kits. All right, so this is, I guess, a little plug for OpenDNS, and for, funny enough, I feel like such a weirdo being a security guy, like, oh yeah, AB is great. Like, really? <laughs> but Symantec Endpoint Protection has an IDS built in, and that little bastard catches a lot of freaking drive-bys. Specifically, OpenDNS has this feature called the Drive-By Download Exploits, and I don't know who runs that for them, I should probably found out and give them a, a plug, but they do a damn good job. Who's stopping Angular left and right? So we also have FireEye that just kind of alerts us, but it's not inline, so it's just more of like, hey, oops, and then we go, damn it, and then we have to go deal with it. <laughs> so that's, that's not really mitigation, if you ask me. All right, but what about you? Who here deals with exploit kits on like a daily basis or, you know, every once in a while? Who works on the blue team here? I'm sure I'm hired, but it's okay. <laughs> I don't want to say. What tools do you use that, that help you mitigate them? <clears throat> Open DNS, cool. Yep. Oh, so you basically uh, correlate activity and you hunt, essentially, right? So what you're saying is basically they're looking for known TTPs that they find in particular samples, and then they hunt for those in their network, and they say, oh, look, oops. Right, then you're basically going to implement those in your custom snort rule or you know, whatever you guys are doing there. Anyone else? What tools are you using? What's helping you with exploit kits? Same with you. Same with me? For us? Uh, and then uh, PSR. Uh, and then oh, you have WebMPS's inline? Yeah. Okay. Wow, well, what a joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, anyone here else have a WebMPS inline? Sounds <laughs> everything. Oh, bastard. That's why we don't have an inline. What about EMPS? Do you have an inline to email appliances? They stop a lot of the. the same type of malware that will be dropped, but of course not. Mm -hmm. Okay, methodologies. We will get a really weird, like, end point, right? And then we'll get a pretty well. 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 For legitimate research, right? Yeah. 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 Well, um, it's kind of what we do have some incidents where the event is for one of those. Yep. Yep. Okay, so basically, he says they have pretty much an implicit deny situation. They whitelist very few sites. Of course, some of those, like you said, can't be. Gotcha. Domain tools API. What else are you guys using for your uh, domain research and reputation scoring? Domain tools, what else? Fast total. Fast total, I get. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? <laughs> no? Fine. Whatever. Alright, uh, open DNS. Investigate. That's good. Virus total. API correlations on those. Those are good. Talking about. Moving on. <laughs> All right, keep me up with exploit kits. Now, I like to just tear apart the samples. I really like reversing, and I like to pretend like I'm a reverse engineer. Like, yeah, I know what I'm doing, and you know, I pretend a lot. So, what I do is I like to pick apart samples, but I don't like to sit there and just look at all the different uh, K's that are occurring and keep up with their changes and variants and all that. I leave that to the professionals. There are four of them that I highly recommend. One of them is Brad's site, malwaretrafficanalysis.net. Our sample today comes from that site. There's also malware for me, which is Jack's site. He's sitting back there. Hey, Jack, how's it going, bud? I'm sorry, I need to, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Did you ask for a really outrageous speaker request? Yes, I did. Maybe a golden speaker request? <laughs> yeah, hell yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's awesome, yay, me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that is so great. Sorry to interrupt you, Mark. Right? I mean, it's so drunk in this thing tonight. <laughs> <laughs>
That is phenomenal. So in the, the call for papers, they had like a, you know, do you have a ridiculous request? And I was like, shit, yeah, I do. <laughs> I want a golden chalice that says chaps on one side, and besides Las Vegas on the other. And I fucking got it. <laughs>
boring, so let's just skip past that. All right, now, I, would, I really want to go into the full analysis of every line of code and how it works, but for sure as hell don't have time for that. This thing's ridiculous. I kept getting pissed off because, like I said, I did this in five weeks, and every time I extract more information, I'm like, yeah, I'm so awesome. It was just like this nether rabbit hole. Like, fucking bitch. <laughs> so for this one, what I'm going to show you is what I did is I basically took out, uh, this is action script three, by the way, which is what you ended up having to debug. So if you don't know action script, you just learn on the fly. Why I did. So you look in here. And what we're doing is we're calling a function called go. Go calls a function called da, da. See that right there? See how da one and passing two and passing three? That's basically it. It generates JavaScript. Technically, it decodes what you're passing into a, a you know. Here. Anyways, <laughs> and then there's the URL you're going to go to. So I just trace these out. Trace is like a console log. You just shoot right to the console, right? And then we get the stuff down here at the bottom, and I compile it here. So we get a JavaScript function. So again. Flash file for the redirect of EI test creates JavaScript. The JavaScript is right here. The JavaScript creates a div called D. It checks to enumerate the client to make sure they're running Internet Explorer. Let me say that one more time. It checks the client to ensure that they are running Internet Explorer. <laughs> now, completely unrelated here, how many of you force your users to use Internet Explorer? Or maybe not you, but management. Oh, shit. You're <laughs> No, you're liars. You're filthy liars. No, 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 no. no. I'm going bluff. All of you. <laughs> You're trying to tell me that you like distribute Chrome or Firefox to your users? Or you allow them to use it? He said they have free will, but they still choose IE because hey! Like if you have a user using IE, just show them a screenshot and be like, hey. <laughs> Stop it. All the AI test redirects, all of them from this particular set of you know campaign redirects. Go Firefox? Nah, screw it. Alright. Anyways, it just bothers me. Okay. And then what it does is down here the inner HTML, it sets it to the base URL of the Swift file itself, plus a little suffix that's made pseudo randomly. And that pseudo random part is created right here in this for loop. And it's basically going to be a bunch of letters and then one of these suffix suffixes right here. So I ripped that part out and I threw it in a loop that runs 20 times. And here's an example of the crap it spits out. So it's going to be the base URL plus some crap like this. Our example is right here. So in our live capture, see that hub uh, curve? <laughs> that's just funky. HTM? Yeah, so that's, that's the actual HTML page that then redirects to the landing page. Uh, here's some more redirect. This is the actual HTML page itself. It tries to redirect these in two different methods. It uses a meta refresh and it uses JavaScript location and rec. Silly stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yep. To reiterate, look, this is all in the background. The user has no idea this is all happening. All right, now we hit the landing page. Yeah. So we've just handed over control of execution from our referring EI test campaign to the actual exploit kit infrastructure. Neutrino uses one Swift file. One Swift file. Now, one Swift file. It's the third time I said that for a reason, and it's in bold up there that we've blocked Flash in our environment. How many of you have blocked Flash? Really? Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> Suck it, right? <laughs> like a trio. So the cool thing about this is, uh, remember the hacking team corpus that came out? Right, when that came out, we actually had, uh, we're recording this one. Uh, <laughs> we had an attempted thing and nothing happened and it was great. So we actually had, we had four attempted emails. I believe Iron Fort mitigated it for us. One of our systems stopped it, but we looked at it and we were like, oh shit, that is targeted as hell. And it was right after they had time, like hours to weaponize it. And we're like, oh damn it. And there was no patch yet, so we kind of freaked out. And uh, after they released three more zero days from Flash within like, what was it, four days or five or a week or something, we're like, done, gone. So if you don't have Flash disabled by now, exploit kit, throw some statistics towards management, and like, just, just cut that crap out. I mean, we still have it on our clients, and we'll whitelist certain internal uses and such, but forget it. Okay, and here's a Swift file coming down. It's boring. There's the actual, it's boring too. All right, the actual, the one Swift file had a decent detection back in early July, I guess, um, yeah, originally for a 713 analysis, 25 out of 55. And uh, AB where even knew it was Neutrino. It's like, ah, we know that. All right. 
Well, they actually, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's asking if we were the virus code, we would see the error list detection. I believe on the sample, it was either that day or a day prior. I, believe, I might have made that shit up. <laughs> I believe. <laughs> All right, the one SWIFT file, and this is what Angular also did, the one flash file contains within it a secondary flash file. The secondary flash file is actually pulled into memory and then executed. So when you're doing analysis, you're really trying to pull out the secondary file, which is what we're going to do. So these binary data blobs are just little binary arrays that are stuck in here, and they get actually converted into, or they get pulled in as a byte array. Anyone familiar with a byte array in ActionScript? You can just kind of guess what it is. Just an array full of byte values via individual direct byte values for fast machine processing. Simple as that. So what we're going to do is, I don't, I don't even know how to, <laughs> I'm admitting I'm recording, damn it. I don't even know if you can put the binary data blobs in it. I don't write flash. I don't know. I learned lingo. You remember Director? You remember Shockwave? You don't remember that? Yeah, back in like 1997, I learned the programming language for it. I studied my ass off and I learned it. And then like two months later, they were like, oh, Flash is better. I was like, fuck. <laughs> Piece of shit. All right, so I don't, I don't know how to do that. But what I do know how to do is I just manually extract the hexadecimal values, paste it in as a string, and then I use Henry, I don't know how to pronounce the name either, Henry T's <laughs> hex.as function. He's got a two array and a from array to convert between strings and arrays. Get it, girl. Just do it our way. And we were drunk last night, and Keith, because he's weird, told me to put Pokeballs on her chin. I don't know why I left him in there. All right, so we're going to do some extraction here. This is where we basically go into demo mode. So let me do a little quick time check there. Oh, yeah, 20 minutes. Oh, yeah, let's do it. So we're going to move over here. Uh, this is a Windows 8 malware VM. Technically, I actually got this when I did a little plug for a SANS Institute. They're Grim. Six, Forensic 610 is their GIC reverse engineering or malware certification. So I went through that. Phenomenal class, by the way. And I just used this for my Windows 8 stuff because it's, you know, I like it. So what are we doing? We're doing uh, stage one. Actually, no, we'll just open up. I'm just going to open up Flash Develop directly and show you how I extract it out of stage two. So this is the part where it gets a little, like two-way communication is going to be kind of hand because I'm just going to show you a bunch of code crap, but yeah, I'll see what we get. So this resolution's horrible, but that's fine. All right, we're going to compile it. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> oh, demo guys, don't be a dick. Oh, it compiled, holy hell. All right, run it. No. That's. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I probably should have opened the proper project. <laughs> funny enough, I really didn't plan that. If you read that on the screen, that was pretty funny. That was 100% an accident, but I enjoyed that thoroughly. <laughs> All right. Uh, so here we go. We're instantiating the class name that they had, and then we're starting it via startdammit.derp, which is going to do this. Yay. All right, the first thing we do is we fill this array called DAMX. And, well, it was called X, but it was pissing me off, so I changed it to DAMX. <laughs> and DAMX is over here, right there. So this array holds some uh, flash-based commands, event listening, adding children to the stage, load bytes. They try to obfuscate by just using this array of referencing index values in it rather than using the phrases, you know, whatever. So we fill that, we do that. OK, go okay. get and over here, it's uh, looking for a stage environment. If you don't have a stage environment, you're probably in some kind of debugger or some type of working environment. So I just skip the part where we check for the stage, and I just, I just call a function. So we call this function called R. And R, this is where it gets kind of funny, because sometimes they just give you like these really freaking obvious names with their variables. Like they try to make it so hard to read. And then you have crap like embed additional info. <laughs> and you have even better. And then RC4 key. <laughs> oh, the river's like, is an RC4. Okay, that's just the variable name. That's kind of weird. So we're loading those, and then this is what we're doing here. See how I, I'm using the function to array, and then I just have a big long that goes off the screen. Hexadecimal value, we're just making our own byte arrays, because that's just that's, that's the way I do it. So once we do that, we then start this guy right here, embed landing. This will eventually be the variable that will contain the decoded second stage, if you can call it second stage technically, I'm going to, uh, swift file that's going to be loaded into memory. 
So as we scroll down, all those different, you remember that big list of binary blobs, basically? Those are all just catted. See, right bytes, right bytes, right bytes, and blah, 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 blah. So we're just going to skip past all that. And then we call this function, there you go. And then we call this function called D. And D is actually a decoder. So I guess they call it D because it decodes. That's cute. And we pass in, and again, look, I didn't write that. They wrote that. <laughs> you pass in your RC4 key, and then your encrypted Swift file. And at this point, now it's decrypted. So what we're doing now is we're going to change it from a byte array to a string. And we're going to call it stage two. I just, that's what I just want to call it. So we do that, and then now we're going to trace it. So tracing it again just means writing it out to the console. So as soon as I step over this, down here, this is the stage two file that we want. So I basically just pop that into a hex file, and then I, there it is. Now, you'll notice that down here, what it does is it actually creates a loader, a flash loader, and then a loader reference object, and that's some more crap you don't care about. And then what it does, it's actually being a sneaky little chump right here. See this uh, function called m? Not only does it decode the second Swift into memory, but then it passes a byte array to a specific function in that second Swift file. And the purpose of that is multifold, actually, but one of the good ones for, for like trying to stop dynamic or static analysis is if you didn't notice that and you simply extracted stage two and you tried to run it, it would be like, where's my parameter? And you're like, oh, fucking parameter. I'm sorry, I just run it. So it's another deobfuscation attempt. It also makes it so they can reuse the second stage container and just push new arrays into it so they can quickly weaponize new crap and push it out. I'm sure it's for other things too, but I don't know. So as soon as we pull that guy out, I popped it up on virus total, and we had a detection ratio of 12 out of 54. And this was uh, a couple weeks ago on the 21st of July. So stage two, I just did that. Moving on. Stage two is is they like step away from the obfuscation, and they're like, oh hell, no one's gonna find this. So we're just gonna name everything like exactly what it is. So there's some binary, what are these called? Binary data blobs again, and they're literally labeled like NW22. But see this underscore Swift right here? See that? They're telling me this is a Swift file for an exploit, and that's one, and that's one, and this is a VB script exploit, and that's one. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, thank you. So, doing analysis on one of these exploits, I identified, I didn't identify the damn thing. It was identified as CE 2015-8651. This is the one part that really pisses me off in this talk because I wish I had time to personally rip all five of these apart and find out exactly to ensure that they are the proper CE that I wanted them to be. I didn't have enough time though, because I had to change from Angular. Damn it. So this particular CVE, this is what virus told said it was. So if this is what it is, it's just an integer overflow. If you're not familiar with an integer overflow, essentially if you have a bucket where you can store a certain amount of contents and you fill it up and you overflow it, you start overflowing your data into places that should not reside. So where you can probably get the instruction pointer to point to, and then you can get remote code execution, and shit like that. So, ah, let's go, uh, let's go pull it out. So we're gonna take a look at the stage two file now. Wait a minute, this goes till 55? Debug shell code before and you're like, raise your hand. Your hand was first. Do you want to help me out later? Possibly. Well, Screw yourself. You screwed yourself, bro. <laughs> 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 gotcha. <laughs> well, I mean, never mind. Alright. That's the core of the cup. What? Alright, here we go. Let's do this. And we're gonna go back into flash develop. We're gonna load stage two and we're just gonna kind of run through the code. So if you're wondering what's going on from this point forward, now we have stage two extracted out, right? And we have also have the binary data that was actually pushed into it, so we're gonna manually just shove that crap in there and run it. And I'm gonna debug through it, show you exactly how it works. Eventually, once it, it creates these five exploits, we picked one, I, I grabbed one of them, and I analyzed that one. But we don't have time to de deeply analyze it, so I'm gonna show you the shell code. We're gonna walk, you were calling. <laughs> Oh, shit. <laughs> I thought he left. I was like, we need to leave. What the hell? <laughs> Screw that guy. I'm not doing that. <laughs> you, sir. What's your name? Ned. Ned? I said, like, you just made that up. Ned. <laughs> Ned. Oh, there. He's gonna walk. We're going to actually have him debug the shell code. And we're going to see what the shell code does. It's really weird. I don't know why they do it. You'll see. All right, so here we go. We have stage. Oh, no, we, we didn't do it yet. 
We're going to open up the proper file before we do something stupid again. Stage two. Close that. And main. Okay, so in stage two, we are using get it girl, and we're passing the array that I extracted out of the previous silliness from that m function. So this is the stuff that's supposed to be hidden, like oh, you're, you're not supposed to know it's there, right? We'll just pop it in there. And what that's gonna do, first we're gonna compile it. Oh, oh. that's new. But I can make all that. And there we go, okay. Get your type declaration. Okay, so as soon as we start debugging, we see that we're in this method three. ET gets called over here. That runs method three. We go in here, so all right, what are we doing? Well, first off, we get rid of this, that's in my way. That's in my way. And there. Okay, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna call method six. Method six is gonna create a variable with strings to enumerate the client, meaning it's gonna find out exactly what machines are running on, what browsers are running, all that other fun stuff, right? So let's take a look at how they do that. Some of this JavaScript does stuff like this. Window.navigator.app name. Simple as that. Just regular JavaScript commands and it pulls the results back in. Another thing it uses is it uses ActionScript's capabilities feature, which I just found out about. So apparently within Flash, within ActionScript 3 itself, you can enumerate what it's running on and such using capabilities library. Okay, so it's going to grab if there's a debugger present, the resolution of the screen, it gets all this crap. So we're just going to step past this and take a look at the results. We didn't step past it yet. Now we did. And bar one. So here's the results of processing that. Screen resolution is a little off here. Now, by the way, I bullshit, I lied. I lied to it. I told it that we're running IE 11, uh, Netscape was my window name, we're running Windows 9, Windows 8 on full string, and I, I gave the user agent string for, I don't know, something, I picked one. And uh, so I just lied to it. Instead of having it try to process that, because we're, we don't have an external interface available in my debugger, so I just told it to, that we had stuff and move on with life. All right, next up, we're gonna call function eight, and our method eight. Ooh. What? Don't you dare, bastard. What are you doing? Oh, I just hit the wrong key. Cool story. All right, so here we're going to fill up this variable called variable2, and this guy does... Oh, where's my locals? Am I blind? Do you see local over here? What did I do? All right, well, whatever. Boop. There we go. So variable2 now is this... Do you remember that byte? array that we actually pushed into the secondary swift that was extracted out. What was in that? Well, it just got decoded. And what was in it is this stuff over here. There's a list of links. These links, the back URL means like if, this, if the exploit fails, like just go back to where the hell you just came from. Uh, there, I don't want to enumerate all of them, but some of them are for the specific exploits. And there's also a ping back. So what this little sucker does is if it finds out that it's about to run an exploit, it hits back to the server and says, hey, we're going to run this one. And it just helps them understand which works best in what environments, basically. Or at least I think that's what it's for, I don't know. And then here, they actually give us, look, they even call it key for the payload. There's our decryption key for the malware it's gonna download later. Oh, cool, <laughs> thanks. Could have obfuscated that a little more, whatever. And then here are the actual, whether it's gonna run these particular vulnerabilities. So three Swift or uh, Flash-based vulnerabilities and two IE DB script based execution chains it's going to try to exploit. Okay, so we jump on past that. I'm gonna stop hitting that six. Why that six do this? Yep. Boop. All right, now we're gonna call method 10. I don't know what the hell it does. Here's what it does. Oh, now we're looking to see if the client is actually inside of a non-standard like browser type of environment. We're looking to see if we're running Phantom, Node.js, Couch.js, Rhino, which is a, a, a front end basically for the SpiderMonkey JavaScript engine, which runs in like Mozilla Firefox. And then also if we're in a debugger. 
So right now, this is part of checking to see, like, should I run right now or should I, like, back off is what it's looking at. And we're going to lie to it, of course, so we're just going to say, yeah, dude, you're good. And then we're going to run into method 11. Method 11 is the pingback. And all this does is it creates an image location. And that image location is just going to ping back to the servers by just trying to access it. And all that does is it tells them, like, so far, so good is what it's doing. Pretty simple stuff. Does it provide an identifier? Surprisingly enough, at this point right here, it does not provide an identifier. It just loads the standard source and gives the link for JS ping. So later on, however, if the, oh, anyone hear the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, so the yeah. That's horrible. I applied this all wrong. Okay, so screw all that. All right, here's what it does at the end. <laughs> Shit. Ah, <laughs> uh, caught me off guard there. <laughs> do I have to leave? Can I do five next questions? Sure. Yeah, yeah, come on. Yeah. Okay, so skipping that uh, slow stuff over there. Here's what happens exploits in a row. Like Ducks sitting on a fence being shot down. We have. Ducks on a fence. Where did that shit come from? You threw me off my game, damn <laughs> We have uh, two different BB script and then we have three different flash exploits. These are separate flash files that are once again loaded into memory, right? So let's go take a look at one of them. I pulled out one of them, and the one that I pulled out was this one right here, the one that executes what I believe is this guy right here. Now, when I extract it out, I'm going to show you how we're going to die for life. So what it does, well, actually, first up, I popped in the virus total this morning, actually. I forgot to upload the virus total. I was like, oh, I should upload the virus total. And when I did, it only had 5 out of 54 hits, and that's actually what tells me it was potentially this particular CD, the signature, which I don't fully trust, but based on the actual chain that I was going to show you, it does look like an integer overflow. I just couldn't confirm it from time. So, but notice, it actually associates it with rig. See this little guy right there? Rig is one of the other popular exploit kits right now. It's not as popular as Neutrino, but it's probably number two, I'm assuming, right now, pretty much. So, what does that little guy do? Well, essentially, it loads up some shellcode. Are you guys familiar with the concept of shellcode? If you're not, oh, I love the slide in. Yay. Shellcode is essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to change the instruction pointer in the CPU, which is what tells the CPU what it's about to run or actually execute. You're trying to overwrite that with the beginning of your personal code. So once you can obtain that, the CPU then starts processing your code. It's called shellcode from an old term just coming from, usually it was used to pop a shell, or like a reverse shell, so that I can maintain access to your, or get access to your system, I should say. So we're gonna take a look at some shellcode. The shellcode that it actually loads in this Swift file does a couple things. It finds itself in memory, required, I'll show you why. It XORs the rest of itself to prevent static analysis. And then it actually creates, or uh, calls process create A, which is the ANSI version of the process creation of the Windows library. So here's static analysis of the shellcode. The problem we have is down here. See where the analysis fails down here? Well, that's because see right here? See that 9A value? That's a single byte XOR key that it's going to use, and it's going to loop. 596 times, or hexadecimal times, and as it loops, it's going to decode itself. So static analysis fails flat because it's not XOR. So we're going to do live analysis. Oops, I that. <laughs> All right, was it Ned? Was your fake name Ned? Yeah. You want to come up here and decode the show code? Uh, sure. Okay, I pop the show code to an executable. We take the executable and we drop it into Ali Debug 2. And Ali Debug, for, all right, what you're going to do is you're basically just going to be pressing one of the F keys when I tell you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> all right, now, now, hold on. So the first thing we're doing here is the show code is actually going to jump down in itself. So you'll notice here it's going to jump short. So go ahead and hit F7. So now we just jumped over here. So you jump to this memory location. This memory location now is going to call back up here. So why the hell is it going to do that? Anyone know why? It pushes the other SD on the What's that? It pushes the other SD on the Yep. So when you do a call, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. When you do a call in assembly language, you're doing two things. You're pushing the next instruction location onto the stack, which is kind of like the working variable zone. Let's just consider that for right now. And then you make a jump. Now, the reason we're doing that is what? Why do we want to have that address on the stack? 
course the buffer's where I'm going. But I'm going to now know where I am. I'm going to know my location. So because of address space layout randomization in Windows, was it Vista enough, right? Uh, Choco, whenever it starts to execute, and even when you're trying to exploit something, you have no idea where you're actually going to land in memory. So by doing this, it's finding out where it exists. Yeah. So go ahead and hit F7 and look down here. <coughs> Boom. See that now? We have the value where we, we reside now. All right. Go ahead and hit uh, F7. We're going to pop it. So now EAX up here contains our location so we know where we are. All right. Hit F7 again. We're going to clear ECX. That's the counter register. So now we're going to basically start some counting. We're going to move this value here into CX, 596 and hex. Go ahead and hit F7. And then we're going to start our loop. This starts the loop right here. Oh, whoops, I'm missing my, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. There you go. We're going to start the decode process. So go ahead and hit F7. Right now we're moving, we're, right now we're actually going to XOR by 9A, and we're pointing to this location over here. Follow and dump, memory address. So right down here, we're gonna start XORing these values. All right, go ahead and hit F7. And you'll notice this changed from B something to 22. It keeps it, I was gonna go through this one more time, we just gotta keep going. Yeah, so basically, yeah, exactly what it's gonna do. So it's starting at the bottom, and it's XORing, it's revealing itself, coming back up toward the top. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna click right here, go ahead and hit uh, F2, and then F2 again, and then hit F9. All right, we just, what we do? <laughs> what the hell did you do, Ned? <laughs> you dick. <laughs> All right, so now what we've just done is we've XORed, un XORed, basically. So if I do this, oh, hey, look. That's the data that was hidden previously. So this is all being done in shell code, in assembly language on the processor, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to jump. So hit F7, and then F7, F7, guess what? F7. Again, 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 whoa, 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 whoa fucking dead. He's, he's, he's like, yeah. <laughs> okay, this right here, we're pushing FS30 points to what's referred to as the process environment block. It's part of the thread information block, the TIB. So essentially what that does is you're trying to find out information about processes that are currently running. So what you want to do is hit F7 again. <coughs> We've just found NTDLL. It was just up there. So what it just did is it just found the location of NTDLL on the system. We're looking for kernel 32. When we find kernel 32, we can then find the functions that live inside kernel 32, and then we can call them do shit. So hit uh, F7 again. I don't, did I write this? Did, did you just write that? Lol and OU? I don't remember if I did that or not. <laughs> All right, F7 again. And again. And one more time. Sure. Yep. And one more. Okay. All right, one more. All right, one more. Okay, one more. And one more. <laughs> and one more. All right, what we're about to do here is we're about to load the functions that are actually inside kernel 32. So if you look at the very top right-hand side up here, hit F7 one more time. I like doing it one more time now. There. The first thing we have up here is a function name, require SRW lock. I don't know what the hell that is. Okay, cool. So what we're looking for right now is now it's going to start a loop. It's looking for a particular Windows API-based function. All right? So I'll, we have a little bit of time. Thank you very much, Ed. Much appreciated. It's going to take the string that it has right now and compare it to these, this value here. And then if it finds that part, it's going to compare it to the next value here. So this is basically what it's looking for. We have the values of what it's looking for. So when we decode that, like say we just pop that into Python, it comes out as uh, we're looking for Eric's, Eric's ass. Yeah! Anyone here named Eric? Anyone? Trying to put your ass, bro? No? <laughs> Whatever. Okay, so it's actually stored in little Indian format, so it's actually backwards. So we're looking for something that starts with create and ends in sub A, which is create process. When we find it, we end up right here. So let's just do that guy. Two, F9 in. That off F9. All right, so we just found the process that we want, and then I'm just going to expedite this process here. Wait for it. Wait for it.
All right, so I skipped past here because the time got me. Ah, oh, what a dick. All right, so what it's going to do is we have this data in here, and it starts with command.exe. See right here? So what that's actually trying to do is the following. It's, it just calls, I was going to show you where it loads the argument, but I wasn't looking in the right place because I got a rush of time, so I skipped it. That's fine. What it's going to do is this right here. It's going to run this. There's also some obfuscation here. The caret, if you try to run that in a JavaScript interpreter, it tries to run an XOR. <laughs> dick. You have to run it in command prompt. Oh, stop now. Which comes to this, and this actually just executes the malware. So it opens up a stream on disk. I was going to show it to you, but we're basically out of time. So this right here, here's the thing though. Why the hell does it do this? The shell code does not execute a call to like URL download or something, but rather it runs command prompt and additional JavaScript that functions as a downloader. So why the hell does it do that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, man. I'm like, that's tough. Just do it. You have code execution on the box. So anyway, so once the malware runs, in this case, it was the bend to try to try to I don't know if or is that the but So it encrypts this, and then everyone's screwed, and everyone cries. So that's it. That's how, uh, that's how the trainer works.
yourself, just install Wireshark. <laughs> so yeah, it's going to look and enumerate to see it's installed. And you're like, well, I better not run. <laughs> yeah, right? Just push it out the SEC or whatever the hell you're using. All right, we're pretty much at it today. I got the double stop now. It just means shut my mouth. So. <laughs> All right, gang, thank you very much.